Hello and welcome to our talk on psychiatric drug therapy. This is the second talk of two and we shall be discussing antipsychotics and anxiolytics. I'm Katie Beck and I'm an FY2 in the Oxfordshire Deanery. And I'm James Kelly and I'm a medical student at UCL. Okay, let's start with antipsychotics. When would you use them? Okay, you could use them in psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder and delusional disorder. They can also be used in depression, where there are features of mania or psychosis. They are also used in delirium and in behavioural disturbances such as in dementia. Are there any other uses? Yeah, they can also be used in a non-psychiatric setting for nausea and vomiting and intractable hiccups. Okay, so how do they work? Antipsychotics act by blocking dopamine D2 receptors in the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. Blockade of these receptors leads to extrapyramidal side effects. We'll discuss these in more depth later. So there are two main types of antipsychotics. The first is the typical antipsychotics, which were developed first, and these block all D2 receptors. The second type are atypical antipsychotics. These have less affinity for D2 receptors and so cause less extrapyramidal side effects. Instead, they block 5-HT2A receptors. Both atypical and typical antipsychotics block other receptors such as muscarinic, histaminergic and alpha-adrenergic receptors. Each antipsychotic has different affinity for all these receptors which leads to varying side effect profiles for each antipsychotic drug. Okay, could you give some common examples of both types? Yeah, so common examples of typical antipsychotics are haloperidol, lupintexol and sulpiride. Examples of atypical antipsychotics include clozapine, olanzapine, risperidone, quetiapine and amisulpiride. Okay, shall we look at extrapyramidal side effects in a bit more detail? Okay, yeah. So, as we said before, extrapyramidal side effects are caused by the blockade of dopamine D2 receptors. This leads to a number of different side effects, including Parkinsonian symptoms, which include muscular rigidity, bradykinesia, and resting tremor. Extrapyramidal side effects also include acute dystonia, which is an involuntary sustained mus muscular contraction or spasm. So examples of this are clenched jaw or the patient's eyes rolling up, which is called an ocular gyric crisis. Extra pyramidal side effects also include akathisia, which is a subjective feeling of restlessness or muscular discomfort. The last one in the group is tardive dyskinesia, this is rhythmic involuntary movements, which can include movements of the head, the limbs and the trunk. This leads to the patient chewing, grimacing of the mouth and protruding and darting movements of the tongue. OK, so apart from that group of side effects, what else do you get? OK, so there are lots of, of side effects and antipsychotics. But again, as we said, they're all different according to the different antipsychotics. And so it's important that when you prescribe these drugs, you look up all the different side effects. But we'll just discuss through the general ones for both typical and atypical antipsychotics. So there's anticholinergic ones, which include dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention and blurred vision. There's alpha adrenergic receptor blockade, leading to postural hypertension, which leads to dizziness and syncope. There's histaminergic receptor blockade, which leads to sedation and weight gain. They can also cause cardiac effects, including prolongation of the QT interval and arrhythmias, which can lead to sudden death. Hyperprolactinemia is also a side effect of antipsychotics. This is because prolactin is under the inhibitory control of dopamine, and so when dopamine levels are decreased, prolactin levels increase, resulting in galactorrhea, amenorrhea, gynecomastia, hypogonadism, sexual dysfunction, and can lead to an increased risk of osteoporosis. There are also dermatological side effects, such as photosensitivity and skin rashes. Other important side effects to consider are that they lower 
the seizure threshold, they can affect the liver and they can also lead to hematological side effects such as agranulocytosis. Okay, so one particularly important side effect to look at is neuroleptic malignant syndrome, isn't it? Yeah, it's really important to look at this one and know about it because it's actually life-threatening and the mortality rate is estimated at about 20%. It occurs in about 0.5% of patients treated with first-generation antipsychotics. It usually occurs within 4 to 11 days of initiation of a treatment or a change of dosage of the treatment. Okay, how would this present? Okay, so it can present with motor signs such as severe muscular rigidity, can also have mental health signs such as fluctuating consciousness and autonomic disturbance such as hypothermia, unstable BP, rapid pulse and sweating. And what would you do if you saw someone with this? Okay, so it's really important that you stop the antipsychotic immediately, you ask for senior help and make arrangements to transfer this patient immediately to the emergency department. And when they're there, they might do blood tests and look for a high creatinine kinase and abnormal LFTs. It's also important to note that actually it's not just antipsychotics that can cause this, it's also SSRIs and lithium. Okay, so you were saying before that there are very specific side effects for each different drug. So what do you think some of the most important ones to know about are? I thought we'd just look at four drugs um, and look at their side effects because actually they're quite important. So I think the most important one to recognise is clozapine, which one of its main side effects is agranulocytosis leading to neutropenia. This is incredibly important because you need to monitor their full blood count regularly to ensure that their neutrophils aren't low and they're not at risk of developing a severe infection that could eventually lead to their death. In fact, it's so important that drug companies require you to do a regular full blood count before they actually allow you to have the drug. Now, the other ones are um, risperidone, and this drug leads to weight gain and increased prolactin. Olanzapine is also known to cause weight gain, sedation, and actually has been linked to a high risk of diabetes. Amosulpuride, I'd say the most notable side effect with this drug would be its increased prolactin. Okay, shall we move on to look at benzodiazepines? Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to we've come to the part where we talk about benzos. So there are some examples. So um, there's lorazepam, temazepam, diazepam, and chlorodiazepoxide. Lorazepam and temazepam are short-acting benzodiazepines and therefore are conventionally called hypnotics. Diazepam and chlorodiazepoxide have a long half-life and they're called anxiolytics. Okay, and how do they work? The main action of benzodiazepines is to potentiate the action of GABA, which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. So, how can you use them? So, they can be used as anxiolytics, hypnotics, and also anticonvulsants and muscle relaxants. More specifically, they're used in things such as anxiety disorders, and I thought we'd talk about that first. So um, they can be used for rapid symptomatic relief when uh, patients are in acute anxiety states. But they're only used in acute states and an acute situation where the anxiety is severe, disabling or very distressing to the individual. They're only used for a short period of time, really just to tide these patients over while other more mainstream treatment and long-term treatments take effect. So really they're not used um, longer than four weeks, that's their absolute maximum. Okay, what do you start using after that? After that, you'd well, actually, really, you'd start right from the beginning using SSRIs, but really, that just gives you a bit of time to allow for the SSRIs to start working. It just covers you during the dark period, as it were. The reason we do this is because, actually, there's a risk of dependence if you keep that drug going on for too long, the benzodiazepines, and there's also the risk of withdrawal. Okay, so what else can you use it for? Okay, well you can also use it for insomnia. You can use them for alcohol withdrawal, for akathisia and acute mania. It can also be used for seizures, so in epilepsy, for muscle spasms, and they use it in anaesthetic pre-medication. 
It's also used in psychosis for rapid tranquilization when that's required. Okay, so what about the side effects of benzodiazepines? Okay, well they can cause drowsiness, ataxia and reduce motor coordination. So it's important to warn people who are going to be driving vehicles of these side effects. They can also cause headaches and confusion. And although it's unlikely in an oral dose, they could cause respiratory depression in an IV dose. I guess the biggest problem about these drugs is the risk of developing dependence. And that's why you usually only use them for a short period of time. Another problem is that you could potentially see a patient who overdoses on benzodiazepines. So it's important to know what their antidote is. And that would be flumezanil, which is a benzodiazepine receptor antagonist. I think at this point as well, it's important to note that alcohol, opiates, tricyclic antidepressants and antihistamines all enhance the effect of benzodiazepines and therefore increase the risk of respiratory depression. Okay, so are there any other hypnotics or anxiolytics that's worth knowing about? Yeah, so there's um, Zopaclone, Zopadem and Zalpon, which are drugs we use for insomnia. They have a short half-life and they act at benzodiazepine receptors but are structurally different. So essentially they can be used as sleeping tablets. Okay, what about anxiolytics? So there's Fosporone, which is a 5-HT1A receptor antagonist. This can be used to treat generalised anxiety disorder. It's actually unrelated to benzodiazepines, and so it's not associated with dependence or abuse, so it can be used long term, but it can actually take up to two weeks to take effect. So this concludes our discussion on anxiolytics and antipsychotics. Thank you for listening.